Hi, guys. My name is Ken Rieger. I'm at New Jersey Spine Center, one of the spine attendings here at uh, Morristown, as well as Overlook and St. Barnabas. And uh, I've been asked to talk about the lumbar spine, much like uh, we just heard a summary of the cervical spine. Today I'd like to talk about uh, a review of the anatomy, although Dr. Gatto has already covered much of that, the diagnostic exam, the treatment options, and then there's a bonus section at the end with frequently asked questions in spine surgery. So I don't have to tell you guys that back pain eats up a lot of your time. A lot of people complain about it. Getting MRI approvals is hard. And obviously, the request for medicine is an evolving thing. But your patients don't, can't tell you enough that their backs hurt. Two-thirds of people are going to report pain in their lifetime and 30% within the last three months. But very few will actually have a true radiculopathy, uh, and even fewer will have motor or sensory deficits like we're talking about. So today, we're going to try to come up with a strategy for dealing with both the regular back pain and then when to refer, how to image, and when to be more aware when there's, a, when there's a real problem. So this is, you guys are gonna get a lot of this kind of picture in the next talk with Dr. Lowenstein, so I'm gonna go ahead and move on. And today, today the, uh, I just wanna focus on sort of four parts of the spine, right? Both posteriorly in the back where the paraspinal muscles are gonna attach, right? The, the anterior vertebral body, anywhere bones touch each other in the body, they need some padding, the cartilage padding in the spine being the discs, right? And then there's the spinal canal uh, directly behind that, right? The disc, as Dr. Gatto described, has the annulus on the outside and the uh, softer, more buoyant nucleus. And obviously, we can run into problems as that uh, starts to age. But today's talk is going to focus on four main topics. Posteriorly, the paraspinal muscles attach. When that fails and people experience a lumbar strain with a strategy to uh, deal with that. Secondly is the discs, when they fail and what to deal, how to deal with that. The neuroforamen, uh, as well as the spinal canal, when that occludes and stenosis occurs, especially in our older population. And then lastly, when, our, when the bones themselves fail and spondylolisthesis can occur. So the good old back strain. You guys see it even more than we do, and everyone else up here, uh, you know, sees back pain for a living. So, what, you're still obligated to uh, examine them, and we've had a nice discussion already about understanding the uh, dermatomes, the myotomes, and so if there's any questions about what nerves do what, certainly in the breakout session we can have a, a uh, quick review of that. The special tests, including uh, reflex testing, looking for symmetry in the lumbar spine is also uh, critical. Now, when we're taking the initial history of the acute back pain, as we've heard a few times now, Cotaquina syndrome is something that you guys are on the lookout for. With uh, It'll present with a radiculopathy, some motor weakness, sensory deficits, but the urinary retention and or incontinence, the saddle anesthesia, and the decreased anal sphincter tone are really the keys to uh, to differentiating this from sciatica or uh, routine back pain. So the treatment of uh, back pain, as we've heard, uh, also known as the usuals today, um, would be uh, physical therapy for four to six weeks. I'm more of a proponent of physical therapy than we've heard uh, up here because it gives people something active to do and also because it educates them and allows them to take something forward once the back pain has resorbed so they're not calling your office the next time. Okay, activity modification, activity is good, bed rest is not. Anti-inflammatories are helpful, obviously we avoid them with, uh, when we see issues like anticoagulants, but blood pressure issues, CHF, and asthma. Muscle relaxers have a very limited role and are only, have only been shown to be useful in 24 to 48 hours. As we know, they're really just sedatives, but if we called them sedatives, nobody would ask for them. There's no role for opioids in today's climate. And there's really no role for Tylenol, TENS units, lidocaine patches, antidepressants as well in the acute setting. Also, your patients are going to be expecting uh, some form of uh, x-rays, MRIs, something that tells them uh, that something's wrong and confirms their experience. But really, this should wait, okay? After six weeks of failed physical therapy, we can consider 
uh, obtaining lumbar x-rays. When you do order x-rays, flexion extension views and dynamic images are far better than the uh, traditional oblique uh, images of lumbar spine. MRIs uh, can be obtained only after the therapy, the anti-inflammatories uh, have failed and neurologic deficits are present, or we're worried about cauda equina syndrome or infection. And there's almost no role for CAT scans or CT myelography, and EMGs that are ordered um, are almost always unnecessary because a simple examination will give us the same information, and rarely does an EMG early on change the clinical uh, course or treatment. But when we do get the MRI and we find out that a disc is herniated, um, we're going to need a strategy for that as well. Usually that's in the middle-aged uh, group of 30 to 50. Or it predominates with the males, and most are down in uh, the bottom two discs at 4.5 and 5.1. There are many risk factors, although everybody uh, is somewhat vulnerable. On exam, the straight leg raise tends to be the... Uh, the the, the clear indicator that, there, that the sciatica is real. And this is pain past the knee when the le leg is elevated from 30 to 70 degrees. The parallel in L2 and L3 is the femoral nerve stretch. When we put that on tension, it hurts. We get a lot of, just to clarify some of the terms, when a disc is going to herniate, right, it moves into the spinal canal. Posterior lateral is the most common. It hits the exiting nerve root. You can also have one centrally coming down here. This tends to occur more in, in uh, young folks, age sort of the 15 to 25 range. And then a foraminal disc herniation can hit out wider into the dorsal root ganglion of the nerve, which is particularly painful and has a slightly less predictable uh, outcome, both conservative and with surgery. We also hear a million other terms about uh, uh, disc bulges, which can be circumferential, we have uh, protrusions and extrusions and sequestrations. Um, everybody uses these terms a little differently, so they're not quite as reliable as this slide would indicate. But the concept of non-operative treatment of a disc herniation is really twofold. First, we can wait for the affected nerve to become more tolerant. And second, the herniation itself can actually resorb. No, it does not go back into the disc because you know, a way to say that is the toothpaste doesn't go back into the tube, okay? But it can resorb. So our options for treatment, and as we've seen with the usuals here, are, include nothing. And it's a statistic that my patients find reassuring is that 90% of sciatica is better within 90 days if people do nothing. But we can do more than nothing, so physical therapy and anti-inflammatories are frequently added. And we usually give this a good six weeks uh, if there's no neurologic deficit. If they present back and there's still an issue, then considering steroids is complete, uh, steroid epi epidural injection is totally reasonable. This is just a delivery system for the steroids to prevent the whole body toxicity that we see with oral steroids. Now, there are a few controversies with this, including the fact that there's absolutely no science behind a, f uh, a series of three injections spaced two weeks apart. And we know if it's uh, stenosis, that it does not change the natural history of the disease. But there is moderate data to support the use uh, of injections for sciatica caused by disc herniations. And there's no role if there's a neurologic deficit. But if patients are symptomatic from nerve root compression from a disc herniation, and they've failed this care, then there's a shared decision-making process where we go over what their options are. The largest study ever is known as the SPORT trial, and this, I promise, will be the only, only talk I talk about, um, the Spine Patient Outcomes Research Trial. And they compared surgery to non-operative uh, care. Patients improved significantly with both groups. The surgical group did improve faster and to a greater degree, and these results were maintained for the eight years of follow-up that we have to date. As a side note, there were poorer outcomes uh, with the following, uh, uh, in the following subsets. If there are neuro neurologic deficits present, significant meaningful weakness, urinary issues, and these are progressive, then a timely surgical decompression is warranted. As one other subset of painless weakness, so they have no pain but their leg doesn't work, that does not respond well to surgery and physical therapy is appropriate. 
Surgery has been shown to be a cost-effective intervention with respect to both direct and indirect cost to society when compared to non-operative groups in disc herniations. So the discectomy, as we had seen from Dr. Gatto's uh, illustration, is, remains the gold standard. It's a 25 to 30 millimeter incision, and it's a 30 minute outpatient procedure. Whether or not surgeons do this with a mini open exposure or tubes, or call it minimally invasive, the goal has to be the same, which is to remove the disc material that is in the wrong place and get the pressure off the nerve. It doesn't matter which way you do it so much as accomplishing this. It's sort of like arguing with your spouse of whether or not to use Waze versus Google. It doesn't matter. All roads are gonna get you to Rome. The outcomes for a discectomy uh, are fairly predictable as well. Sciatica and leg pain relief will get better. Nerve recovery is less predictable. Strength and sensation, it's variable based on the degree of uh, compression and deficit and the duration for which it was uh, injured. Cotarquina, the urinary incontinence is often permanent, which is one reason why surgeons want to get to it as fast as possible. Expectations after a discectomy is office workers can return to work in one to three weeks and a laborer in four to six weeks. So one example is an L5-S1 disc herniation, 38-year-old woman with a significant uh, left S1 radiculopathy. We treated her conservatively. This didn't work. We then had epidural injections. Those worked moderately. She decided to tough it out. This was her uh, presenting films. We can see the left, one, uh, left S1 nerve root being compressed. And then she suddenly started to feel better but her primary care doc wanted to check up on her spine. So 18 months later, obtained a new MRI, okay? And we can see that the disc herniation had resorbed over a year and a half, and the nerve root had completely opened up. So while none of the spine surgeons here would have ordered that MRI, it makes for a cool comparison. Disc herniation, 18 months later, totally resorbed. Nerve root compression, gone with conservative care. Next patient was a 37-year-old woman, very similar, who presented with sciatica, numbness, weak, weakness, and urinary uh, incontinence, perineal numbness, and an enormous disc herniation that obliterated her spinal canal. Clearly, this represented a surgical emergency, and this needed urgent decompression. The next topic is stenosis, right? And stenosis is simply the crowding of a tunnel in the body. All right, in the spine, that's the central spinal canal. And this occurs in our aging population, and one to two million people are diagnosed annually. And this is the quintessential older woman leaning over the shopping cart just trying to get through the market. She can't stand, she can't uh, walk any distance, and has exercise intolerance. Their examination is normally fairly normal with the exception of a hunched over kyphotic posture and an inability to complete the exam because they want to sit down. The treatment plan is uh, unchanged, Epidural injections are appropriate if they are not a good surgical candidate with between age or if a fusion would be required. Understanding it does not change the natural history of the disease. We image to find the potential causes. X-rays are gonna show, the flexion extension will show us uh, any spondylolisthesis that exists. AP and lateral radiographs will show us uh, any scoliosis. And the MRI will determine the degree of stenosis and the spinal levels involved. Laminectomy, as Dr. Gatto had pointed out, remains the gold standard and is the most common procedure performed by all spine surgeons in the country. And the goal is simply to open the room for the nerves, whether, and whether or not that's removing the lamina, the ligamentum flavum, facet hypertrophy, it is the rotor rooter of spine surgery because it works, okay? Opening up the space for the nerves, seeing it with your own eyes, that they have enough room without creating instability is the key to success. Here's an axial cut, nerves squished, nerves not squished. Not, not a super hard concept. We can do things on a smaller scale and just do one side, or you can do the whole thing in multiple levels, depending on uh, what the patient requires. So the results of laminectomy are fairly predictable. There is significant improvement in one's ability to stand and walk. Leg pain, if it was present, will also improve. What is far less predictable is back pain relief. Here's an example of, what's, of stenosis on a sagittal T2 MRI. We can see the hourglass effect and the narrowing of the spinal canal. And in, uh, in this 58-year-old woman with neurogenic claudication, a laminectomy was performed from L3 to L5. 
and the relief that uh, I had described uh, was accomplished. The last topic I want to cover is uh, spondylolisthesis or, slip, uh, or the slippage of the spine. And it's when one bone slides forward uh, on another. Right? And what we can see is the natural harmony of the spine is disrupted when one pops forward on the other. This can be caused by six types, but two are really most prevalent. The first is if the bones break at the pars intraarticularis. This is usually uh, occurs in our youth, in our teenage years, uh, from repetitive hyperextension and can go on where there's a gap and, and a loss of the bony restraint. Okay, and the other is degenerative, meaning the, the facet joints just get old and become incompetent. All right, and it's about 5% of the population for each of those. We measure the degree of slippage based on how far uh, it goes from grading it from one to four. Grade one is clearly the most common because that's the smallest slip. However, when the bones start moving in ways they're not supposed to, this starts a cascade which will create other problems because the discs are much like our skin. They can take an unlimited amount of pressure. But the minute we add some shear, they fall apart quickly. And so as the lumbar disc degenerates, that will put unnecessary stress on the facets and they'll wear out. The ligaments will hypertrophy, it will stimulate our body's arthritic response. Because everyone in this room knows that arthritis is not a disease, it is our body's natural response to perceived instability. So it will respond and things will hypertrophy to try to stiffen and stop the movement which will then take up the room the nerves need and create spinal stenosis, and we'll have the same picture of, uh, uh, of neurogenic claudication. Only this time, with the bones moving in ways they're not supposed to, the back pain will be, will be a larger component of the, of the complaints. For imaging, uh, x-rays, MRI, CT scan, uh, all totally reasonable to document the type and the degree, as I had uh, stated. But with almost 10% of the population having one of these, 10% do not need surgery. We just need to figure out how to help them deal with this as best they can. And physical therapy, medications, and steroids are all reasonable options. And surgery should really only be considered for persistent or recurrent pain, causing reductions in, uh, in function in uh, daily life. The goal of surgery then would be twofold. One is to get the pressure off the nerves, and that's accomplished with the laminectomy, as we had spoken about. Or, and then number two, is if we, or if we simply did a laminectomy and we took out what the body put in to make it more stable, that would make the spine less stable. And so it would rev the engine that created the problem in the first place. So a lumbar fusion and stopping the bones from moving stops the engine that is driving the problem. So we have to do a laminectomy and a fusion. Much like when an orthopedist puts bones together, if a bone breaks, they put it together. They wrap it in a cast and they wait. All right, so we position the bones where we want it, we stabilize it with some rods and screws, and then we wait. So the instrumentation is really just a cast on the inside of the body. And we wait three months for it to heal. But we're not dealing with kids the way a lot of orthopedists are. So then we wait some more months, and usually it takes about a year, year and a half, for a solid fusion to, to be achieved. And so here's a 55-year-old woman uh, with a grade one spondylolisthesis uh, on x-ray and, and a predictable amount of accompanying stenosis, neurogenic claudication, and so a posterior laminectomy and instrumented fusion was performed. Relief of the leg pain, relief of the back pain once the recovery was over. But there are lots of different ways to get there. Here's a 52-year-old uh, gentleman with back pain, numbness, sciatica, failed care, and ultimately was, was needed for surgery. And so here, uh, we did a posterolateral laminectomy instrument of fusion. But as Dr. Gatto said uh, in his speech, the, the anterior disc space is such a rich fusion bed that uh, this was taken advantage of, a reduction was accomplished. And so that's with a transforaminal interbody fusion. And then the last patient, similar, little bit larger slip, and a decision in this case was to move anteriorly for the best lever arm to reduce that, okay, before stabilizing it posteriorly. So spinal from a surgical end can be accomplished 
uh, posteriorly, posterior while reaching to the front or from the front and the back. It depends on the patient, uh, the case, and the situation. Lastly, I'd just like to hit a few uh, frequently asked questions. This is the bonus part of the talk. What about laser surgery? There is no quality evidence of acceptable outcomes. This is an exclusively out-of-network racket performed by the fringe of spine surgeons. And these are now rapidly going out of business nationally. And in summary, this fails the test of the family test. There is nobody speaking today that would let their family member have laser spine surgery. So what about chiropractic care, acupuncture, herbs, cupping, needling, et cetera? Head-to-head -head studies have shown that all methods contribute in lumbar spine about the same. And probably it's because of the self-limiting nature of a lumbar strain, which is what most people present with anyways. However, as I said earlier, none are as strong as the long-term plan of physical therapy, at least in my opinion, because of the, the patient education and the empowerment aspect. It gives them something to do and allows them to feel in control. And then lastly, but are there any spine surgeons in network? The, the answer is yes, my group is in network. Thank you very much. Any questions?